Tonight's Bible reading is from James 3, verses 13 to 18. James 3, starting at verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raised a harvest, harvest of righteousness. Uh, you're a little bit spread out, but at least you're here, and that's a good thing. Um, it's lovely to see all of you here this evening um, as we continue our series in James. I was at a very small church that has uh, only been going for about two years, speaking at their camp uh, on Saturday, which is why I wasn't at the men's breakfast. And it was lovely just to be with a, another group of believers um, let's pray. Our Father, what a great privilege it is to be known by you. It is a privilege because were we left to our own ends, not one of us here tonight would have turned towards you. For your word declares, no one seeks after God. No, not one. And it is because you have sought after us and reached down from heaven and quite literally plucked us from the fires of hell that we are here this evening. So thank you for the preciousness of our salvation. Bought with the blood of your own son, the Lord Jesus Christ, on the cross. We thank you for the reality of our salvation. And we thank you for what we have sung about it this evening. Particularly about the future dimension of that salvation. And how at one level it's almost impossible for us to think of the glorious reality of one day when Christ returns in the twinkling of an eye, in the moment, being transformed and being given our new spiritual body and going to dwell with you in the home of righteousness forever, where we will not be subject to some of the pain and suffering we have experienced in this world. But until then, you have put us, put us on a road and you have called us to be those who will be faithful to you, who will grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. So as we endeavor to do that this evening, may you reveal yourself again to us. Be merciful to us, we pray, and speak to us. For Jesus' sake, amen. There is an interesting story about a young man who came to Socrates. Now, if you know your history, you'll know who Socrates was. If you don't know your history, go and look it up. I don't have time to explain that to you this evening. But he came to Socrates asking him for knowledge. He walked up to the muscular philosopher and said, Oh, great Socrates, I come to you for knowledge. Socrates recognized a pompous numbskull when he saw one. He led the young man through the streets to the sea 
and chest deep into water. Then he asked, what do you want? Knowledge, O oh wise Socrates, said the young man with a smile. Socrates put his strong hands on the young man's shoulders and pushed him under. Thirty seconds later, Socrates let him up. What do you want? He asked again. Wisdom, the young man spluttered, O oh great and wise Socrates. Thank goodness no one calls me great and wise. I'm anything but. Socrates crunched him again. Under, 30 seconds passed, 35, 40, Socrates let him up. The young man was gasping. What do you want, young man? Between heavy breathing and breaths, the fellow wheezed. Knowledge, wise and wonderful. Socrates jammed him under again. 40 seconds passed, 50 seconds passed. What do you want? Air, the young man screeched. I need air. When you want knowledge, if you have just wanted air, then you will have knowledge. So let me ask you, how much do you really want God's wisdom? Is it an overriding passion or is it just kind of a passing fancy? Do we want the wisdom of God because... It is from that wellspring of God's wisdom found in Christ because we are told in the Scriptures, Christ is our wisdom. In order that we might live the kind of lives that would glorify Him, that would shine the Lord Jesus Christ. Or do we want wisdom because, you know, it would be nice to be thought of as kind of a wise person. Do we really want wisdom for selfish reasons or do we want wisdom in order that we might better live our Christian lives in a way that would point others to the Lord Jesus Christ? Do we desperately want to be wise for the sake of Him or for our own perverted desires? And so what James does here is he says to this congregation he's writing to, I'm going to show you two different types of wisdom. If you want to be wise, so you want to be wise, he says, okay, let's take a look at what the difference is between those who are wise in God's sight and those who are unwise in God's sight. And he leads them down this path. So let's take a look and see where we fit in. Firstly, I want you to notice the essence of wisdom, verse 13. The essence of wisdom. Who is wise and understanding among you? Now, let's just pause there. The question is an interrogative question. Um, I struggle with that word. I don't know why. There's some words you just struggle with, but that's one of them. Interrogative question that he asked them. Now, the question that is posed is not just posed towards those who teach. It is specifically, certainly applicable for those who teach, but it's broader than that. He doesn't just limit it to teachers. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by the deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. He does not reduce this to a test, and thank you to Russell for doing this PowerPoint. What took me two hours took Russell two minutes, according to Russell. So thanks, Russell. Really appreciate the effort you put in, in putting together this. It's not my work. It's his work. Um, he does not uh, reduce the test to anything doctrinal or theological. Isn't that interesting? Sometimes we can think of wisdom in terms of those who have got a head stuffed full of knowledge and who can quote Bible verse after Bible verse after Bible verse. Now, that's not a bad thing. Don't misunderstand me. You need to learn God's word off by heart. But that's not the test that he uses, is it? It's very practical because James is a very practical book. The basis on which wisdom can be shown is in two areas. Humility and good works. And the one springs from the others. It is, in fact, James saying, good works done in an attitude of humility. 
Now, humility is one of those really difficult things to come to terms with, isn't it? How do you know that you're humble? I mean, some people are proud about their humility. And of course, that is anything but humility. We don't go around claiming to be humble. And yet, Peter says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. In other words, humility is not something that just happens in a vacuum. It's not as if I put my head down on the pillow one night and say, Lord, make me humble, and then I wake up the next morning and suddenly I've discovered that I've gone from proud to being humble. It doesn't work like that. That command that is given, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, is a command. So there is an action that is required from us in order for us to become humble. We don't just sit back and do nothing about it. But at the same time, coupled to that, humility never goes about trying to act as though we are humble, but rather it understands and comes to grapple and wrestle with God who He is and in relation to who we are. And it comes to understand the smallness of who we are in comparison to the greatness of who God is. And that is a long, time-consuming process because we, are very, we very easily and tend to elevate ourselves above what we think we are. After all, does not Paul write to the Philippian church and say, consider others better than yourselves? Who does that? Don't we sometimes compare ourselves to others and think of ourselves as better than them? And yet the Scripture says we should consider others better than ourselves. Humility is about understanding the fact that God is the creator and sovereign of the universe, and we are like dust. In fact, it is into dust that God breathes. And you and I were created, were we not? Humility recognizes the reality that every single breath we take, every action we commit, every ability we possess, every natural talent that we have derives from God Almighty. Those people who achieve great success in this world achieve it only by God's divine grace. Those who have charismatic gifts or personality, who attract people to themselves and are, are liked by everyone, is because of God's grace exercise towards them. And James says, if you are ever going to be wise, it starts, it begins with humility. Begins with understanding who we are. And we are told that Jesus was like that, weren't we? Matthew eleven twenty nine. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, because or for I am gentle and humble in heart. Or John fifteen five, we are reminded. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. The very next breath you draw is dependent upon God's grace. And so humility comes to recognize one's position before God. And is sober-minded in how you respond in that. It never takes credit for any of its achievements. Humility recognizes that whatever I am able to achieve is a gift of God's grace. And always points back to the Lord Jesus Christ. It never boasts. It never lords it over others. It never considers itself 
superior to other people. And that, let me tell you, is a rare gift that you see in people. Humility is not something I think we ever realize we possess, but it is always recognized by others in us. They see and know those who are truly humble. And then it expresses itself in good works. Now, the good works that he speaks about here is as broad as you can think. In fact, really what he's saying is humility comes forth in the way in which we live. Our, lives are, our lives, rather, are lived out in a way that show and kind of demonstrate, if I can put it like, the holiness of God in us. 1 Peter 2 verse 12, he has already said, live such good lives among the pagans that, they though, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. So Peter says the what good deeds looks like in that context is you're living lives that are so in tune with God, so in step with Christ, that when the unbeliever says something about you that's false, the evidence against the accusation will be proved by how you live. And those accusations will fall away because others will point to the good deeds by which you are, are living your life and they will say, that can't be true because I know so-and-so by what they demonstrate in their lives. And so in 2 Peter 3, 11, he says, since you, everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. So if we are ever going to be wise in God's sight, it starts with humility. And so one of the things that you and I do in order to be humble in the way in which we express our works is we never boast. We never look for affirmation. We just serve and serve and serve. And if no one ever comes up to us, and please don't misunderstand me, we need to encourage one another. But if no one ever comes up to us and says, thanks, it never worries us. For the only thanks we look for and the only approval we seek is not from people, but is from God. And the only words we desire to hear one day is when we stand before God and he says to us, well done, good and faithful servant. His opinion matters more than anyone else's opinion. We live for him. We live for his glory. We strive to please him. And we do it in his strength with all humility. Spurgeon tells the story that maybe will help bring this home. He tells the story of a certain king who had a minstrel whom he commanded to play before him. It was a day of high feasting. The cups were flowing and many guests were assembled. The minstrel laid his fingers among the strings on his harp and woke them all to the sweetest melody. But the hymn was to the glory of himself. It was a celebration of the exploits of song which the bard himself had performed. In a high-sounding strain, he sang himself and all his glories. When the feast was over, the harper said to the monarch, O king, give me pay. Let the minstrel's fee be paid. Then the monarch replied, You have sung to yourself. Pay yourself. Your own praises were your theme. 
be your own paymaster. The harpist cried, didn't I sing sweetly, O king? Give me my gold. The king answered, so much the worse for your pride that you should lavish such sweetness on yourself. Go away. You shall not serve in my train again. And then he comments, if a man should grow gray-headed in the performance of good works, Yet, when the last it is known that he has done them all for himself, that he may be honored by his works, his Lord will say, you have done well enough in the eyes of men, but so much the worse because you did it only to yourself, that your own praises might be sung and your own name might be extolled. So what do people say of you? When you serve God, who are you looking to please? Whose approval makes the most importance to you? When you serve, when you do your good works, are you doing it for the approval of others? Are you doing it so others will pat you on the back? Or do you do it for the glory of God? And when God gives us success in some area of life, whether it's academically, whether it's in the sporting realm, whether it's in our working realm, how do we handle that? Do we give thanks to God that he should have so blessed us? Or do we think that it's because of our natural gifts and talents? that we have achieved what we achieve. There are so many subtle forms of boasting amongst Christians that sometimes we miss them. The truly humble person only ever glories in Christ and Christ alone. Is that you? Is that me? The enemy of wisdom, if that is the essence of wisdom, look at the enemy of wisdom, verses 14 to 16. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, of the devil. Whoa, there's a lot there. Simply put, false wisdom as is solely on man's understanding. It considers man to be supreme. Number one, it's distorted motivation, verse 14. It's distorted motivation here that James is writing about are groups of people who surround themselves around a particular person and they become envious of others who may also have people who like them. And so it's distorted in its motivation because what it's seeking is it's seeking to garner up support. It's seeking that everyone just agrees with it. And when its ideas are challenged, and when it is challenged, it becomes angry and aggressive and defensive. Their problem was a a self-seeking ambition. It was bent on gaining prestige. It was bent on gaining honor. And so anyone who challenged that particular position was dismissed with impunity, was marginalized, was sent to the outer side. It wouldn't tolerate that. You had to just simply toe the line. Furthermore, it warns them about boasting about their wisdom. They are the opposite of humility. They seek to garner little groups of followers and want them to support them in all of their proclamations. Boasting here means one who takes pride in, one who has confidence in, confidence in themselves, pride in themselves. James says that kind of motivation has nothing to do with God. It's distorted Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24 provides the background. Let me read it to you. This is what Yahweh says. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the strong man boast of his strength, or the rich man boast of his riches. 
But let him who boasts, boasts about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am Yahweh, who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness here on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. Here is the background of this. To boast about our own wisdom, to boast and become jealous and envious about others who may also be considered to be wise and may also have people who respect and admire them, says James, is the enemy of wisdom, is the enemy of God's wisdom. Secondly, it's deadly characteristics, verse 15. It's deadly characteristics. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but as earthly, he gives three things here, earthly and spiritual of the devil. So let's take those briefly. Three basic characteristics of false wisdom. Number one, it's worldly. That's what earthly means. In other words, it bases itself on secular ideas. It's worldly in the sense that it embraces worldly values. It is driven by the world's idea of what wisdom is. It elevates the world's wisdom above all else, so that when that comes into conflict with godly wisdom, it's the worldly wisdom that prevails. It simply succumbs to what the world says is right and wrong, and it embraces that. So in our society today, gee, the examples are just multiplied, aren't they? Worldly wisdom. It's better to live together before you get married so that you can just see whether or not that relationship is going to work. After all, how stupid are you if you get married and you've never actually experienced living together? How do you know that you're compatible? Isn't that the worldly wisdom? And God says that is unbiblical and ungodly. Worldly wisdom. Love is love. How can you say to the homosexual who loves someone of the same sex that they shouldn't have the right to get married? Love is love. And the voice shouts, and some churches succumb and embrace that. And some churches have. There's a particular denomination in this country that at its recent synod made the proclamation that its churches are bound to approve and sanction same-sex marriages. You can look it up on the internet. Really? That's worldly wisdom. Worldly wisdom shouts loudly, but it's not something that Christians should ever bow to. There may be lots of arguments why certain things should be justified. Arguments why people should be allowed to go to a doctor and change their sex from male to female, from female to male. But the Christian stands upon the truth of God's word and says, I don't care whether the voices are loud and strong and whether there are lots of them around. We know what God has revealed. We stand on God's word. The unwise person succumbs and just bows down to the world's wisdom. Secondly, it's fleshly. It's fleshly in what he means by that when he says um, uh, it does not come down from heaven but is earthly and unspiritual. It is unspiritual in the sense that it arises out of the sinful heart of man. What the scripture says, those who are truly wise are wise because they have the Spirit of God dwelling in them. So the person, if they're going to be truly wise in this world, need to have a relationship with God and their wisdom is informed by the Spirit who dwells in them. After all, man's wisdom is considered by God to be foolishness. And it's only those who are truly born again who truly have the Spirit of God in them, that truly understand what true wisdom is. And so anything outside of that is unspiritual and originates from sinful man. And sinful man lives independently of God. His heart is blackened. His mind is blackened. He doesn't understand spiritual things because he has no insight. He's bound by sin. He's living in darkness. He's chained to Satan. 
He lives in the kingdom of darkness, and that kingdom of darkness drives him so that all the decisions and the heart is bound up in that darkness, which is why we have so much uh, discord, so many wars in society, so many people committing crimes in society because they're driven by the sinful heart. And James says such a person is unspiritual in all that they do. And then finally, it is demonic. In other words, what James is saying here, the source of all that kind of wisdom has its base in the devil. It has its origins in Satan. Scripture is very clear at this point. You're either in the kingdom of light or you're in the kingdom of darkness. There is no mediating position. Either you belong to Jesus or you belong to Satan. There is no in-between state. And if you belong to Satan, then he is the source of all that comes into the heart. He is the ultimate source. Yes, that doesn't mean that you're demon-possessed. What it means is that he is the driver behind your thinking. And he distorts the thinking of the unbelieving person. He controls them. He is the puppeteer. They are the puppet in his hands. He drives them. He is the ultimate one who causes them to behave the way that they do. And it's only, therefore, through supernatural conversion, through Jesus Christ coming and killing that old person who is bound to Satan and creating in us a new person that you and I have any hope in this world. It's only when God shines his light and replaces the darkness with light that you and I come to understand what true wisdom is. The source here comes from Satan. Thirdly, it's dire results, verse 16. Look what its results are, he tells us. For where you have envy, selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. So what are the results? Disorder and every evil practice. Disorder means opposition to the established authority, instability, unrest, turmoil, insurrection. That's pretty broad, isn't it? It refers to people constantly in opposition to leaders and generally promoting disorder and disunity amongst themselves. Those who are bent on their own ambitions, bent on their own desires, allow their the way in which they operate to cause disunity, constantly rebelling against leaders. It is in 1 Corinthians 14, 33, the problem of the Corinthian church, which is a church that is filled with disorder as people seek to promote themselves and seek to allow their own agendas to prevail. It's that sense of disorder and disunity that doesn't come from God. For in Christ, we are bound together. In Christ, we are unified. And anything that separates or breaks that unity never comes from God, ever. It comes from the devil. He is the originator of disunity, disorder, chaos. Every evil practice refers in the broadest possible to way to all the bad results produced by human wisdom. I was just having a conversation with someone. Let me just give you a really practical example. Recently, I read a book written by a person who has gone through the operation of being taken, a transgender operation, and then after however many years has regretted that and wanted to go back and wanted to recover their original sex, what God created them to be. And this person was writing about the experience of those that no one talks about in the media, that no one ever raises to the surface, of those who have had 
medical procedures and then later in life have regretted it and wanted to reverse what has happened but now can't reverse what's happened. It's irreversible and are now stuck between these two things. They're not a male, they're not a female, they're somewhere in between and live in depression, alcoholism, in isolation. We don't hear about that, do we? That's the chaos and the disorder that results from worldly wisdom being applied. The world says, let them do it. In Victoria, you don't even need your parents' permission. You can just go as a 13-year-old and have an operation without telling your parents, and they can't stop you. And the world champions that. And the Bible says what happens to that is it's just disorder, chaos, pain, suffering, and sadness. All kinds of bad results from human wisdom. And you can multiply the examples in the world in which we live. We're seeing it now. We're seeing Western society unravel before our eyes because of the foolishness of the leaders who are making decisions in accordance with human wisdom and God having been removed from the picture. We're living in those times. You're watching before your eyes West, the Western world unravel at a rate of knots because God has been relegated to the background. And then thirdly, very quickly, we're not going to have time to go through this in any detail. My time is done. The essentials of wisdom. What are the essentials of wisdom then? Verses 17 and 18. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. That is the overall foundation of wisdom, pure. Out of purity arises the other characteristics. Pure motivation. It is innocent. It is morally blameless. And when it talks about the purity there, it talks about a purity that is based on the very nature, the very character of God. It is intrinsic to God. Everything God does is morally right. God cannot ever make a morally wrong decision. Every time he acts, every time he speaks, every purpose he accomplishes arises out of his moral purity. And what this is saying is that since we are in Christ, since Christ has forgiven us, since we have been cleansed, since our nature has been changed, since we have been made in Christ, we too possess that moral purity. And we need to draw on the moral purity of Christ and ensure that every decision we make arises out of a heart that is morally pure, that is grounded in Christ. And that operates according to Christ. Moral purity. Matthew 5, 8 reminds us, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. 1 John 3, verse 2. I love these, this verse in verse 3. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope, listen, everyone who has this hope purifies himself just as he is pure. I love the balance there, right? It's saying we are already pure, and it's because we are pure in Christ that we take time to ensure that we remain pure by purifying ourselves and staying away from those things that would contaminate us and cause us to become impure. In other words, it is a fleeing from sin. It is a fleeing from anything that is immoral. It is a staying away from that, that we remain pure in Christ. Do you get it? David in Psalm 51 verse 10 after that, terrible sin with Bathsheba and that confession cries out, create in me a pure heart, O God. We sing the song, don't we? And renew a right spirit within me. Let me ask you, how pure is your heart? 
Is it being constantly cleansed by the blood of Jesus? Is it constantly bringing itself into to the foot of the cross and saying, Oh Lord, expose any impurity in me. Reveal it to me, Lord. Show it that I might bow before you and lay it down at the foot of the cross. Oh God, cleanse me. Is that a regular habit of your prayer life? Secondly, as proper characteristics, I'm just going to mention these. We don't have time to expound them, unfortunately. It's peace-loving. It seeks harmonious relationships. It doesn't start conflict. It doesn't delight in conflict. It doesn't promote conflict. It doesn't seek to be difficult for the sake of being difficult. That doesn't mean it sacrifices truth at all costs. It still holds on to the truth, but where possible, it seeks to avoid conflict. It's considerate. It doesn't consist on every right letter of the law or custom. In other words, it's tolerant. It doesn't always have to be right. It doesn't major on the minors. It's considerate of others and considerate of perhaps the differences they may have in terms of certain things that they believe in that we don't believe in. It's not condemnatory in that sense. It's submissive. In other words, <clears throat> it is open to reason. In other words, where it is proved to be wrong, it admits it, it concedes, and it adjusts. It doesn't become so pig-headed that it only ever sees its own rightness and is unable to be teachable. Christian, can I encourage you, never, ever lose a teachable spirit. We should all remain teachable in the hands of God. It is full of mercy. Its primary concern is the need of others, not self. Mercy means I don't get what I do deserve. Sometimes it shows mercy even though the person who has offended it may deserve something other, but it is quick to show mercy for it understands how much mercy it has received from God. And God has not treated us as our sins deserved. It is full of good fruit. It refers to every, every sort of good work and deed. It demonstrates itself in the fruitfulness of the way in which it lives through its attitudes, actions, and words. It is impartial. It refers not to being judgmental or divisive. It treats all people the same. It doesn't pander to certain groups. It doesn't seek to garner support when it has a particular position. It doesn't seek to, to try and promote a particular group of people because it wants certain things done. It's impartial. It treats all people the same. It's sincere. It means being without pretense. It is not hypocritical. Critical. It's not two-faced. It doesn't say one thing and then do something completely different. It is consistent in the way it operates. It's not two-faced. Comedian Irmo Phillips used to tell this story. He said, in a conversation with a person I recently met, I asked, are you a, sorry, that's not the one, are you a Protestant or a Catholic? Sorry, that's not the, I'm, I'm reading the wrong one. I'm going to skip that one. The story of a man who came down to North Carolina mountains. He was all dressed and carrying a Bible. A friend saw him and said, Elias, what's happening? Where are you going? All dressed up like that. Elias said, I've been hearing about New Orleans, and I hear there's a lot of free-running liquor and a lot of gambling and a lot of real good naughty shows. The friend looked at him over and said, but Elias, you're carrying a Bible under your arm. And Elias replied, well... If it's as good as they say it is, I might as, well, might as well stay over till Sunday and go to church. The contradiction, right? What do our lives look like? Do they contradict what we claim? Is our wisdom sincere? Is there consistency to our words and our actions? Do we say one thing and then go and behave in a completely different way when no one else is around? 
And then finally, it's positive results. Now, again, I don't have time to expound this. There's a clear relationship between godly wisdom, righteousness, and peace. And now what he means here, and the NRV is translated this right. It's a difficult phrase to translate. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. In other words, those who operate in a peaceful way enable others to live in a righteous way produce righteousness precisely because they're not contentious and they don't create an environment where it's difficult to be righteous because you're always fighting over things. But they provide the kind of environment that is peaceful, that is, is able and to promote righteous living, is enabled to cause people to want to live righteously because they're not engaged in constant conflict about things. The ultimate fruit of those who are peaceable is righteousness, provides the right setting. So godly wisdom has great benefits. It will lead to righteous living. It will lead to others being able to demonstrate their righteousness. So you want to be wise. Then we will run after godly wisdom. We will run after what James says is true wisdom and we will reject the false wisdom of the world. And if you're a Christian here tonight, there is nothing stopping you from possessing this wisdom. All of you, all of you, without exception, can be those who show what this wisdom truly looks like because you're a Christian. And God has given you the grace, the strength, the ability to truly, truly be wise in his sight. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would help us to embrace the wisdom that comes from above and not the wisdom that comes from below. Help us not to be self-deceived. Help us not to be led astray by worldly wisdom that so often pressurizes us to try and accept it's reasoning, but help us to seek the godly wisdom that comes from you, that is empowered by the power of the Spirit in us. May we become more and more like Christ, who is the epitome of what wisdom really looks like, for Jesus' sake.